In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Well, as long as I can remember, the annual Christmas sermon has in one way or another reflected a Richard Niebuhr's Christ versus culture conflict. The hyper the culture of hyper busyness in the 80s that we preached against and the culture of commercialism in the 90s, the culture of sensitivity at the turn of the millennium, and now perhaps the culture of the snowflakes. Um, what we can do with snowflakes, I don't know. Um, all of these proved uh, fun fodder for biblical preaching and to teach the babe in the manger as always the answer. But in sermons and theological essays through the years, what apparently has not happened is to make clear what Christmas itself is really about. I have a collection of recent news articles reporting that Santa Claus has been banned, Rudolph the Reindeer banished, Jingle Bells censored everywhere from office parties to college campuses because Santa and company have been discerned to be Christian religious symbols. Well, that hurts my feelings. <laughs> at least, at least long ago when, um, when nativity displays were removed from public sight, the Christmas revelation was told. The controversy itself served to draw people's attention to the real story. But that Santa is now seen to be a religious figure simply reflects poorly on all of us Christians. That we have failed to make the message of Christmas known. We have failed to under untangle the secular Christmas from the Christian Christmas. And for Christmas only Christians to replace for them the sentimental with the sacred. So that is my goal, the goal of my sermon tonight, to make the meaning of Christmas crystal clear, at least so that we are clear on the Santa versus Jesus issue, or at best to explain God's light overcoming the darkness. Now, firstly, let me not be misinterpreted uh, that I want to denigrate the winter holidays. First of all, I plan to cook like everybody else, a magnificent meal tomorrow. Um, and I do sing, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow, from Columbus Day to Memorial Day every year. And certainly as a nation founded on Christian truth, our secular celebrations reflect Christian Christmas. Christmas lights and the winter darkness, the light of truth penetrating our moral abyss. Meaningful gifts are shared among us, reflecting God's gift of his presence in Jesus. Uh, I remember as a child getting new underwear for Christmas. My mother saying that in the same way you really need Jesus in your life, you also need new underwear in your life. I've never really quite unpacked the theological significance of that with her. Uh, our friend Bishop Alpha Muhammad, for whom this room is named, the founder of our Mignoni Orphans Partnership, used to say to me, Americans find it hard to truly accept the gospel because they have never experienced real darkness. And it is true, isn't it? During the holidays, we put the sun's rotational darkness to flight. A little eggnog and a standing rib roast and the, darkness day, the darkest days are staved off till next winter. Now, I want to be careful here not to offend or spoil the moment, but how by creating a fantasy at Christmas or at any other time do we really solve the long-term problem of the emptiness that is eating away within us? Biblically, darkness is used to summarize evil and suffering. On one level, we can see this right in our midst. Our country has become more and more divided by a politically manufactured uh, racism and social division. The basic societal unit of the family has been diminished by divorce and impropriety. The moral and motivational fiber 
of our country is torn by a pervasive drug-induced irresponsibility. But still, the even deeper darkness of human trafficking, of genocide, of honor killings are for us at a significant distance. We can't really put a face to them. Did you know that if you make more than $40,000 a year, you are a global one percenter? If you make even $20,000 a year, you have an income in the top 5% of the world's population. I mention all this because sometimes we can have created so much light for ourselves that we miss the light coming into the world. We miss the significance of and the need for Jesus. In our confidence, we can create a better world for ourselves, so much so that we think we can stave off suffering and despair with sort of that gingerbread feeling the first hymn spoke about. Suffering and despair are important and should not be covered up with either opulence or opiates, but rather embraced, knowing God will use our suffering, making our witness all the more powerful and believable. Suffering and despair actually serve an important purpose, opening us to God's presence, influence, and healing, loosening the grip and limiting the importance of our self-created distractions. Suffering and despair offer the setting in which our faith actually and fully comes, uh, becomes effective within us. Our own witness to faith becomes most visually persuasive in the midst of our obvious suffering and despair. Our friends and enemies in that context can really see its action, its activity, and its truth. Suffering provides the darkness in which God's light can shine into our lives. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 22, the verse immediately before our reading from chapter 9 tonight, makes this point about looking to ourselves for salvation. It says, and they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. The first truth of Christmas is that the darkness surrounds us and there is nothing we ourselves can do that does not ultimately just simply thicken the darkness for us. The second truth is that there is the brightest light coming to us, not from among us, but from beyond us, from God himself. Our scripture lessons this evening began with a reading from Isaiah. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. St. John reports, the true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. And our epistle proclaims the good news with great precision. God is that light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And to this, John's wonderful words of victory and hope. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can't overcome it. We live, you and I, in what C.S. Lewis famously called the Shadowlands. And the only way to discover there is a bright hope beyond the darkness and shadows, the grime and deprivation, is for someone beyond the fallen world, untainted by sin, to come into our shadowy land sent to us in God's purpose to bring us where in creation he intended us to be in the first place. The message of the New Testament and Christmas is that Jesus of Nazareth is that one sent to us by God's own design to bring us to where God intends us to be, where we belong, where we are wanted, where we are welcomed. Christmas is the true story of the world, of a loving God's quest to find we who are his lost humanity, restoring us to his tender care, admitting us to his kingdom come. Here is the good news available to us tonight. 
to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. Well, what is it like to be children of God? It is what our final blessing tonight will describe. Not only believing in and receiving Jesus with all our heart and soul and mind, um, but it can open to us the life we can have, and that is the joy of the angels, the humility of the shepherds, the perseverance of the wise men, the peace of the Christ child. I mean, just think of those words. Let them soak their way into your very bone marrow. Let them warm your heart and can focus your mind. Joy, humility, perseverance, and peace. And that is God coming very close to you. Many of our secular friends this evening and tomorrow are busy trying to create happiness and frivolity to dispel the darkness, but the darkness, just plain human sin and dysfunction, will ultimately overcome that fantasy, will ultimately overcome our own fantasies. But to those of us who are here tonight, those for whom the reality of God is the organizing principle of their daily life, is the center and subject of their Christmas. To those around the world whose focus is the worship of Christ, we are made children of God. And that is what Christmas is about. The kingdom of God breaking into our midst, ourselves now admitted as its citizens, the coming of our only mediator and advocate whose light the darkness will never overcome, the babe born in a manger, Jesus Christ. Jesus, who himself represents God to us and will represent then us to God, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. The light coming into the world, the hope of Christmas, is so beautifully described by the prophet Micah. Here are Micah's words. Who is a God like thee, pardoning iniquity? and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever, but because he delights in steadfast love, he will again have compassion upon us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Thou wilt cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. That is the meaning and hope of Christmas. Whereas Santa Claus brings toys down the chimney, Jesus accomplishes for us what we can never accomplish for ourselves. And as the story unfolds, redemption and resurrection, forgiveness and hope, light which is life, bringing to us, enlivening within us, the joy of the angels, the humility of the shepherds, the perseverance of the wise men, and the peace of the Christ child. Amen.